So welcome to the CMO Spotlight, Mark Roberts. So thank you so much for being with me, Mark. Uh, thanks for the invite. Glad to be here. Absolutely. So Mark, tell us a little bit about yourself and your journey, your, your career path that led to your current role. I'm going to date myself a little bit now in that uh, I actually started out in tech in Intel. So Andy Grove days, only the paranoid survived, uh, which was a really interesting uh, it was a really interesting company and just an incredibly dynamic time for, for tech at that point in time. And um, then got into the networking industry. So with a company that's no longer around, 3Com. I made the choice of Cisco and 3Com at the time. Yeah, yeah. I chose 3Com. <laughs> Decisions in your, your career <laughs> that had a meaningful monetary impact. That was one of them to the negative. And um, then after playing with the mega caps for a while, I, I felt that I wanted to go and try a couple of uh, startup world, something that was a little faster movement and dynamic. And um, did a, an IPO uh, of a company called Accord Networks that was then purchased by Polycom, the video conferencing. Yeah. And now you can see the connection into conferencing. So you fast forward short L and then PGI. And, and I can tell from your accent that you're from South Georgia. You're from the Southern part of Georgia. <laughs> Actually, right? I normally say LA, it's uh, yeah, lower <laughs> Alabama, Birmingham. I was actually born in Birmingham, UK, but yes. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Yeah, UK. Excellent. So um, it, I'm going to ask you just about from a career standpoint, uh, is there a piece of advice that you wish you had gotten early in your career that you could have benefited from much later in your career? I wish somebody had been blunter with me earlier in my career and just mm. shut up and listen. Mm, absolutely. And, and, and I think early on in your career, you're so keen to make an impression and want to engage and be heard. And it, I don't think it's really the right way to approach it. Looking back on it, I would have been much better served actually just listening, thinking through the responses and trying to figure out who I am versus who I wanted everybody to, to see me as. Mm. So that, you know, that just... Every once in a while, take a step back and just take a look at yourself. Take a look at the surroundings. What actually makes you tick? Uh, are you getting that from your surroundings? And if you're not, what can you do to actually make that right? Because um, quite often it's not speaking. It's, it's listening. Yeah. Uh, I, I had an early boss. I don't remember which famous pundit this was, but you know, seek to understand before you seek to be understood is what he said to me. I think this was good to great or you know uh, yeah. Collins or somebody that said that originally but it sounds like that was that was what you you wish you had spent more time listening and less time talking or I, I certainly spent more time transmitting than receiving early on in my career we all do. and I should have done it the other way around <laughs> I think we all do we all do so so Mark tell us what's your superpower if you have a superpower that you bring to your current mm. role what is your superpower I think I, we all I have think... a superpower yeah, yeah, maybe I don't have one. I, I don't know. I'll let others judge based on the, uh, the interview when they're looking at it afterwards. I think um, um, early on, I took a stint in sales. And, um, and I would encourage anyone that wants to be in marketing for any length of time to go do that. To just take a, might be a year, might be two years, but go see how that downstream, uh, what, it, what it's like to be doing that role, because it's, it's the easiest job in the world when it's going well, and <laughs> it's not, it's horrific. <laughs> and as a marketeer, you can massively impact that. And, and I think having a, just a clear understanding of that is critical. So to go back to your question, I, I think it's being able to see the entire picture of that buyer's journey, the prospect all the way through being a customer, the customer experience, how that rolls through and impacts with brand. And, and being able to map that out for a, a marketing organization, I, I think is my superpower. Now I'm sure the people that work with me might say differently, but. That, that's great. That's, that's, a, that's being able to connect the different dots is something that not everybody does well. And so that's important, especially being the head of the marketing organization. You, you know, there are people on your team maybe that are focused more on a specific discipline uh, you know, good at email marketing, good at social media, good at whatever brand, but being able to connect those dots is something that not everybody can do. No, that's, that's really the point. It says marketing has got more and more technical and you have to have a deeper and deeper understanding of specific disciplines, trying to actually pull the team together and around a common idea, a concept, or ideally a brand or a user experience, a customer experience, however you want to describe that, how 
an outside individual perceives the company, being able to pull all of that together so you're all headed in roughly the same direction, I, I believe is where I excel. Excellent. So what's your biggest challenge now in your current role? Um, I, yeah. And we're doing this interview during COVID-19. It's okay. We can, we so can put that as a... <laughs> it could be a COVID challenge if it's not. Because it, it really is a COVID challenge. It's, yeah. um, I, I think what's gone on, particularly as we're, we're in this uh, dreadful pandemic, and again, hopefully we're looking at this at some stage in the future, uh, reminiscing about that uh, and not fondly. Um, but it's the, it's the creativity, I think, that is the hardest part. You know, when you kind of said, okay, now the teams can't actually meet together, that, that exchange of ideas that happens, um, just people sparking off each other, it, it's very, very difficult over these kind of uh, solutions, computer mediated, you know, this sort of thing. It just, it just doesn't have the same connective tissue that it does when you're in the office and when you're kicking an idea around. And so I, I think that's been the biggest challenge. And then the other aspect of that was you almost tend to over-rotate. And this is now not a COVID-19 um, statement. It, it's when anything that's got a large disruptive factor comes into your life, you kind of, you tend to over-rotate towards it. And where I'm going is the, you know, if you went back 10 years, everyone was saying, well, we should do viral videos without really understanding what a viral video really was right. or why it was viral in its first right, instance. Right. Well, we'll make it a that, that was. Yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll just make a video and it'll be viral. Right. So we all gravitated towards that. Like, how do we do that? And I think um, we're in one of those situations with COVID-19 because now we can't do things like the trade shows, et cetera. And what we're trying to do is just really replicate what we did prior to these restrictions in a very different world instead yep. of just going back to the basics. So right. what are you trying to sell? What are you, what's the message you're trying to get across? And then using the tactics and the activities to, to do that and make it real. I, I think the biggest challenge to answer your question bluntly is to get back to focusing on the customer rather than that narcissistic internal view that a company tends to have of us. Oh my God, how do we communicate? And how do we do things? Absolutely. You doing something is not interesting. What do your customer or your prospect want to do? Absolutely. And, and to your point about creativity, uh, I think that particularly during the global pandemic and during a large challenging time like this, creativity comes into, to, should we be trying to just replicate what we were doing pre-pandemic in this environment, or should we be coming up with a new paradigm for how to reach and engage with consumers and things like that? I, th I think we, we saw it in spades with the, the approach of, um, uh, you used to go to a trade show, you used to have an event. Well, we can't do that, so let's do it virtually. And the, the mistake was you're trying to do that large event virtually, and it's just never going to be the same. the same. Thing. Yeah, not the same. <laughs> so we, we spent a lot of time as a company working through, um, going back to what PGI does, but, but working through how to actually keep that engagement going and, and how to create something that's new and relevant and really pertaining to what you're trying to communicate rather than trying to replicate a, a physical event. Yeah, absolutely. So you've been at PGI, I think a little over two years now. So now that you've been there, what keeps the, other than COVID, what keeps the role interesting for you? You know, what, 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 is, what is the, um, what's been most stimulating for you over the last yeah. couple of years? I, for me, I tend to geek out on the technology, uh, though I've talked a lot about buyer's journey, customer journey, prospects and engagements, etc. What keeps these kind of roles fresh for me is how fast and just how much the ideas and concepts of the, the, you know, the support in technology to allow us to engage in new, innovative and meaningful ways. Um, I find that fascinating, and, but more so from the human aspect of we all know we're being stalked. We all know that we're talking to bots these days. We all we know these things intuitively, and yet our acceptance and our willingness to to do that it, it just it continually amazes and surprises me. Absolutely. Um, so, where do you or your team find inspiration? Maybe from outside of marketing. You know, you know how do you find inspiration for your team or for yourself? Yeah, funny, uh, funny you should bring that up as a topic. So um, we used to have sessions where we kind of kick it around and it would just be, okay, what did you see this week that would be interesting? And, and we, 
purposely take the time out of the day to to sit around and have those discussions. And obviously, it's it's difficult to do now. Mm-hmm. Um, we actually adopted. Um, uh, we use Slack internally, and so we actually just adopted a channel which was marked in inspiration. And it, it's amazing how faster uh, some of those topics come up because it's not in a uh, you know a meeting, a back and forth kind of thing. It can happen at any time in real time throughout the entire day, evening. It's actually a really, really good way to kind of kick around those ideas. So we actually do it through a, a Slack channel. Um, oh. it's surprising where it comes from. You, you kind of get the old school, you know, the fast moving consumer goods and some of the car advertising through the Tesla all the way through to the obvious apples, et cetera, of the world. But, and the conversational marketing guys in between, it's, it's really interesting world right now to gain inspiration. I love it. So in terms of leadership, how do you, uh, what are the most important values that you demonstrate as a leader or that you want your team to demonstrate? Uh, for me, it's integrity and um, the uh, and a willingness to explore and be curious and to promote those kind of things. I always make sure that there's a certain percentage of the budget that's just put away to one side for experimentation. Mm. And uh, you know, sometimes it's really paid off, and sometimes it really hasn't. But over a period of time, you, you kind of you get a feel for what's going to work and and who's actually really good at experimenting and playing around with that. And and not everybody is. Mm -hmm. And so it's a question of really finding some of those individuals that you can can get behind it. They can then bring the concepts and the ideas back into the rest of the group because not everybody wants to move at the same pace. And, um, but yeah, we, that's the approach. So, um, what advice would you give somebody going into, a role similar to yours is that curiosity and integrity or are there, you know, I, by the way, uh, we have six values here at Setup, and one of our values is curiosity and one of them is honorable specifically. Um, so we, we, I, I, I'm with you hundred percent on that, but I, I guess I'm curious, what advice would you give somebody that's entering a role similar to yours? At, um... I get your KPIs nailed down first, what you think you're measuring and, and what you think is actually going to contribute in a meaningful fashion. But once you've got that done, to back to my previous comment, you've, you've, got to, you've got to operate in a way where people are, are okay exploring when there's a problem. Mm. Um, and so we have this mantra here of, look, you, you can come to the table with the KPI being red. You know, we just do a simple you know, green, yellow, red. It, it's, you can own the KPI and you can be at the table with it being red because the problem's red, not you. Now, you, you, you need to have had the intellectual honesty that you've got that problem and you, you go find answers to it and, and work you know, left and right, up north and south. You've got to figure out how to resolve it, but it, it's okay to come and discuss a real problem. Don't hide the problem. It's not going to get better. These are, these are rarely considered to be a fine wine. They don't get better with age. You know, let's get it on the table early. <laughs> and the faster, right? right, right. Yeah, yeah, let's get it on the table early and let's get this thing dealt with. Uh, I, I had the good fortune to be able to ask this the chief marketing officer, or not the chief marketing officer, C, CEO of MailChimp, uh, which is now, I think, a $4 billion company, his yeah. superpower. And he said his superpower was being able to put the turd on the table, is what he called it, which was, you know, uh, that is a superpower. <laughs> Little blunter, but it's exactly the same thing. Exactly. Let's get let's get this big smelly thing on the table and pick yeah, it up. Yeah. You've got the smart people around the table. You've got to trust in them. So if you you're going to step into one of these roles, the first thing you need to understand is that you don't understand everything. Right. Right. And you've got the smart people around the table. So if you've got the ability to get a problem on the table and have the smart people looking at it, take it. Yeah. Nobody's looking at you for for every single response. It's yeah. uh, your, your role is to lead. It's not to do. Love it. So um, set up, we're, we're matchmakers for brands and marketing agencies for the most part. And so we work in that space between marketing agencies and brands. Um, so I'm just curious, how do you work with agencies today? You know, do you have agency partners that are supporting you and how do you, how do you leverage them? What, what things do you always outsource to an agency? What things do you keep in house? Yeah. Um, actually, if I take the last part first, so the, the, the things we tend to look at to outsource are, um, it, it's really around the creative aspect. Uh, 
And what I find is that over a period of time, if you bring that creative capability in-house, and I'm not talking about somebody that can just help with the web layouts and, and you know, his graphic design or something. Yeah, exactly. This is more the um, just the the idea and the concept, that, that creative aspect. That I tend to outsource. And I found that if you bring it in-house over a period of time, it, as everything, we get stale. Um, the last thing you want to be doing is rotating employees out just because they don't have a great idea. Uh, right. And so I prefer to go outside to get that. Um, I think when you look at things that uh, I, I talk about it as being versatile in that it's a, you've got a certain workload and all of a sudden, if it gets this tall and this, you know, this wide, I need some way to absorb that capacity. So we keep a, a series of relationships of, um, uh, with agencies that just do things that we need to do day in, day out, but occasionally we don't have the capacity for it. Um, but again, my preference is to run the, the internal, the internal marketing team fairly hot. By that, I mean, it's, you've got a full day's work if you work at PGI. I don't think yeah. anyone would sit and say, hey, we're twiddling our thumbs. Um, but uh, I'd rather not hire more to fix that. I'd rather go with an agency. And just right. then you've got this ebb and flow, this expansion that's, that's just extremely useful. We, we often say that, that clients hire agencies because of capacity issues that you're talking about or capability issues where you, it may not make sense to have an expert in every single discipline on the team where you might hire an agency for a specific discipline. So you may have a great email marketing person, but you don't have a great content creator, or you may have a great content exactly. creator, but you don't have a PR person or something like that. And um, so I don't know if, if that's the case for you, where, where sometimes it's capacity and sometimes it's a capability thing to- Very much so. I, it, you more eloquently stated exactly what we do. It's exactly the way that I think about it and approach it. Um, yeah, that's uh, having the ability to reach outside and put your hands on some resources that can get up to speed and get moving very well, and are used to doing that because there's so, the cultural aspect of how you actually work with a, a company as well. That uh, not all agencies are good at doing that. Well, it's funny you say that too, because the one other thing we talk about is there's capability and chemistry. So, you, you, you know, on paper, an agency might look perfect for you because they have experience in your category or experience in a specific discipline, but then you may just not click with them or your team might not right. click with them. And so when we, when we connect brands and agencies, we usually try to connect several agencies that all are good on paper and all have the capability and then leave it to the client to decide if you've got chemistry and, you know, which one has chemistry. Um, are we, um, uh, a few years ago, we, uh, in a different company, publicly quoted, and we had some of those issues and somebody suggested, well, look, we're all in the same room as employees. Why aren't the agencies? Hmm. And so we, we actually grabbed all of the agencies that we work with and unusually brought everybody into one meeting to, to actually kind of pick through it yeah. as a, and some of these guys are competing in other areas. Right. In the, right. the, the same you know, box and we're all playing. Exactly. Different. The contracts that they had, had them in this particular quadrant. It was a really interesting exercise. And I, I, I wasn't sure how it was going to work out, but it worked out incredibly well. So when selecting a new agency partner, what traits are very important to you? Like, what are you looking for when you're picking a partner to solve a problem or help you solve a problem? For me, it does go to that, that cultural fit. You refer to it as, uh, as chemistry. And if I can't get that good feeling early on, um, if you feel you're just being sold to rather than somebody trying to understand it, if, if you don't have somebody that's curious, inquisitive and uh, can give examples of where things haven't really gone that well and what they did to repair it. I, I just, it turns me off instantly. So I, I tend to make my mind up uh, fairly quickly after the team have gone through the initial assessments. You can kind of get a good feel as to whether it's going to be okay or not. With it. Yeah, right. right. It, you know, it's a personal thing at the end of the day. And it, it, it's just not working straight away. I, I walk, I go find another one. Well, it's funny because one of my questions was going to be, how do you evaluate your agency partners on an ongoing basis? It sounds like you, you do that pretty regularly as well. We do, but um, it, it's somewhat informal and, in, uh, and formal. So the formal stuff is fairly easy. It's like, did we get all of the you know, ABCs that we agreed yeah. to do? Um, but what I'm more interested in is how the team feel that they're working together. And uh, 
it's rare you come across one where it's just a complete non-fit, but it's happened before. And mm. my advice would be to anyone out there that finds themselves in that position, again, move quicker than slower. Yeah. Uh, again, it's it's not a fine wine. Get the turd on the table. This yeah, thing right. is just going to keep festering, however you'd like to describe it, but deal right. with it quick. It's not going to get better. Right. So um, we're, I'm going to shift gears to a different topic. Uh, just in terms of results, how do you show the value of marketing to the rest of the company that may not be as marketing focused? How do you, how do you prove the value of marketing to the non-marketers in the organization? Yeah. And everybody's a marketeer in the organization. Right. <laughs> right, right. Can do than you. Amateur, right. <laughs> yeah, right. Right. Um, I, I tie it to specific results. So I, I tie it to uh, a contribution to revenue and all of the other KPIs we have, uh, a lead or lag indicators into how much revenue actually came from marketing activities or marketing generated activities. And it depends on the industry you're working in, the go to market structure, the sales leaders, uh, what that flow is as to what that percentage would be. So I, I, I wouldn't really set any guidelines there, but if you're going to do this and you really want to be in marketing for any length of time, you got to figure out what you're actually putting on the table as it relates to real results that a company cares about. And they don't care about your media signal. They don't care about how many impressions. They don't right, care right, about right. any of that. They those are care soft. about soft. revenue. Right. They're all soft. Yeah. Now, you can argue all day long. Those are lead indicators to yeah. get to that point. And I'm totally okay with that. But the only thing the board cares about is what did you do? Absolutely. So, so, so tell me about a, a, it can either be at PGI or it could be in, in your past, your, your history before. Tell me about a campaign or program that you're, particularly proud of that been a part of? Um, oh my God, out of all the campaigns we've run. Or, or alternatively, is there one that taught you something, you know, a lesson that you really needed to learn? <laughs> yeah, yeah, actually that's a lot easier to, right. uh, to bring up because you, you feel those and um, <laughs> right, right. I mean, you should, as you talk about campaigns and just as a, a side, my, my philosophy tends not to be a specific campaign that runs for a very you know, a funny period of time. I prefer the, it's just a continual wrap around an overall brand and a theme and uh, you know a series of tactics that will run around that. And too often, uh, one of the lessons has been too often you, you put too much effort and too much uh, investment and resources behind a specific campaign and it's kind of an all or nothing. I mean, right. It's a scary world out there. Right? Right. If you don't right. nail that campaign, right. <clears throat> I found you're a lot better with even you know smaller micro campaigns, maybe a, a better way to do it. So just run it for a, a couple of three weeks, look at the data, test and adjust. And I, I've had it in the past, um, in particular, trying to work through channel organizations where you've put these monolithic campaigns in place. Um, had one a few years ago, and it was just an unmitigated disaster. It's, mm. uh, we felt that it tested very well. Um, the learning was that we mainly tested it internally, and we all thought it was great. <laughs> um, you got it a externally. Bit of an echo chamber, I guess. Uh, no, hey, we all agreed. We thought yeah. it was wonderful. Right. And um, yeah, the, the learning was, uh, yeah, you, you might think you've got it nailed internally, but go ask a customer. Go ask a prospect. Yeah. In fact, if I could give anyone any advice at all, is ignore a customer. Right. Go ask a prospect. Mm. And 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 uh, one other, I'll add one caveat to that is don't rely on what they say, rely on what they do. Yes, you have to be, this is back to that curious aspect we were talking about before, but you, you can't just take it at face value of, uh, yeah, we agree with you. That's a good idea. No, you, you got to get underneath why it's a good idea, why yeah. they agree, what's going on. Because uh, rarely are you saying exactly the same thing. It's, uh, it's you, you get two people in a room, you're going to have at least three opinions. Absolutely. <laughs> so, okay, I've got, to, to wrap things up, I've got some fun questions for you. Um, okay. You have nothing to do with business for the most part. So in which fictional realm or story would you most like to live for, for me it's star wars i think it would be fascinating to live in, in, in star wars but is there a fictional star wars. realm? seriously star wars 
you've got Game of Thrones going on. I mean, it's only just recently finished. You wouldn't would you want to be a part of that? To that? Would you want to be a part of that, though? <laughs> well, I'd have to define what kind of part I was playing, I guess. But <laughs> it was, I, I think I'd, I'd like one of those just fantastical out of just out of this world kind of. Well, I guess Star Wars is that one. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Uh, not this world. Let's get out uh, of COVID world. Actually, I want to go back to pre-COVID. Like that's that realm I'd love to be in. Right to January or something, <laughs> or to the future when we're watching this. Let's go post-COVID. That's the realm I want to be in. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's definitely dystopian. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what's a uh, movie or quote or book or a band? that really inspires you? It doesn't have to be a work thing, it could be, but is there a book, movie, quote, oh. band, or band um, that inspires you? Yeah, yeah. I think the uh, some of the easy ones, you, you know, you, you respond, okay, Queen, and it's, uh, just some of the stuff they achieved and et cetera, et cetera, but that's such a cliche. It's, uh, I'm gonna go for quotes, I think, and um, I'm gonna go at opposite ends of arguably the, uh, the, the intellectual uh, chasm. I, I, this one I, is attributed to Kissinger and if it's not him, if somebody wants to DM me, I'm more than happy to change <laughs> my statement here. But it, it was something along the lines of, if it's gonna come out sooner or later, it's better that it comes out sooner rather than later. Mm. And I, I just take this as the, again, when you've got an issue, uh, particularly in business, you, you gotta deal with it. You, you gotta have that. Yeah that moral fortitude to go, okay, this is massively uncomfortable, but I'm going to get this done and get us back on a track and, and yeah. get it in the right direction. And ideally back on plan. If, uh, which takes me to the other one, oh, go which ahead. is uh, Mike Tyson. I think he said, everybody's got a plan until they get punched in the face. Right. That, <laughs> that feels like 2020 all over such, again. <laughs> such a profet who, who knew that you would have such a, uh, you know, uh, a Mike Tyson. quote from, from a boxer, right? Of all, I, people. I know. of all people. Okay, uh, two more. One is, uh, where do you find joy outside of work? Um, I, I actually, I like to do things that are, um, you put your hands on it in the, it, it's old cars or it, it's, it's something mechanical, it's something getting dirty, oily. There's, there's a physical toil thing that I really enjoy. I've been sat all day at a desk and in meetings and, you know, thinking through things. I, I really like that tactile. Um, so if I'm in a de-stress, you'll often find me buried underneath an old car full of parts so, and what's things the that dream? I don't understand how to put them back together. What's the dream car then? It sounds like there's a dream automobile that's like you. Yeah. I, I'd probably trade what I've got right now and go back a little older. I, I'd probably um, a Ferrari out of the 70s, something oh, cool. like that, or, or 80s, maybe a 512 DBI, something like that. And could you work on that? I mean, is, is, it, is it simple enough a, 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 a machine that you could actually work on it? I was given a great lesson in this a few years ago, and um, uh, we were taking apart something that... Um, ostensibly you think it was massively complex. It was a Ferrari. And so we're taking this thing apart and I'm getting more and more worried as the thing starts to look like a jigsaw puzzle. <laughs> and the guy that's doing it with me said, you know, at the end of the day, don't worry about it. It's just nuts and bolts. So all you got to do is put them back again in sequence. And you kind of think about from a work perspective as well. It's like, look, if you can just break it down into those, mm -hmm. those pieces, no matter how complex it looks, it can go back together. You just got to figure out what the math is for it. I love that. But, okay, yeah, so just nuts and bolts. <laughs> I love that. Um, so, last question is: Is there a brand that you've never worked on that most inspires you, and why? Uh, yeah, actually, I'm, I'm going to um, I'm going to go back to the car the, with, with Ferrari, and the the reason being, um, uh, you've got a a very uh, niche manufacturer there that uh, actually artificially restricts. Um, supply so i mean they're, they're playing with the very very essence of supply and demand and how we think about economics and yet they've they've done so in arguably some of the most difficult financial times and yet still continued and managed to grow to the mm -hmm. point where it's it's not just a car and a concept it's a lifestyle and a, a complete luxury brand that they've built out of this and not many of the others have, have managed to achieve that mm -hmm. so when i i think about um the, the brand and, and what they're doing around their racing, their DNA, and how they wrap that entire thing together. So to me, it's just a very, very cohesive story that's, that's often hard to create around a brand. 
a uh, hats off to them. I think they've done a great job. And by the way, they sell cars that we all aspire to. Well, yeah, right, right, right. But... <laughs> it's aspirational both bo- yeah, products aspirational. and also in the the the, the marketing, you know, um, the, the mystique of the brand and, and the way they've built a, a real um, space that's unique from anybody else. Well, most of the, the um, I mean, you, you, you look at the, uh, the revenue uh, and this, uh, stick the cars away to one side, you know, most of the apparel and the, the branding aspects, uh, they're all owned and bought by people who don't own Ferrari cars. Mm, right. Now, that's a sweeping statement. They, there are people that do, yeah, but sure. how you achieve that and how you, how you get such affinity uh, for a, an aspirational vehicle and, and continue to maintain that over the years, I, I just think so. it's just a stunning success story. That's great. Well, uh, uh, it's interesting that, that um, you know, each automobile manufacturer particularly, I think has found, has really sought to find their niche. And I think Ferrari has really done, done so in a really special way. So that's cool. And I'd go the other end of the market too with Tesla. Uh, I think that what those guys have done from, um, you know, Elon Musk has achieved from a, a marketing perspective, you, you just, it's a, it's a masterclass in how to stay relevant. Well, and, and it is, I, I appreciate Tesla more so for their purpose as a company and the fact that uh, it's not about building fast cars that don't use gas. It's about sustainability and, and, and you know, um, the car is the manifestation of the overall purpose and mission of sustainability. So I think that's, that's really clever to, to have, you know, taken something that is, as ubiquitous as an automobile and turned it into a kind of a paradigm for, not a paradigm, but, but a uh, analogy for a larger purpose and mission. No, it's true. The revenue stream is, uh, you know, it's almost secondary to what they claim in their overall position is and what they stand for, what they represent. Yeah. It's, it, it, again, a stunning achievement, masterclass yeah. in staying relevant. Fantastic. All right. Well, thank you, Mark Roberts. Really appreciate your joining me today.